Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight for an artist talk with Kaylee Bartell, our current resident artist at the James Castle House. Uh, my name is Rachel Reichert, and I am the cultural sites manager for the Department of Arts and History. And with me is Lavona Andrew, our ASL interpreter tonight. Um, before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge this unprecedented moment. Um, tonight marks the first event the James Castle House has hosted in over six months. And for those of you who know us, that's a very unusual cadence for us. Um, these are strange times and they've been hard for all of us, including many artists and creative individuals, along with the organizations that support them. Um, so we really appreciate your support tonight and encourage you to find other ways to help our broader cultural community in the coming months. We are all in this together. Um, I wanna thank the city of Boise and their ongoing support for remaining committed to the work of the Boise City Department of Arts and History. The James Castle House is a program of arts and history, which offers many other services, including public art, history programs, archives, cultural grants, and care and conservation, along with advocacy and support for our broader cultural community. The James Castle House celebrates the life and work of American artist James Castle through exhibitions, community programs, research, conservation of Castle's historic shed and trailer, where he lived and worked for over four decades. However, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the broader history of the land that James Castle House sits on. We need to recognize the ancestral, cultural, traditional, and unceded territory of the Shoshone, Bannock, and Northern Paiute people whose land we are meeting on today. Rooted in history and place, the James Castle House hosts an ongoing residency program supporting other artists' lives and creative works. This residency program began in 2018 and hosted and has hosted five 10 week residencies and three short stays, short stay residencies over the past two years. We are excited to introduce you to our current resident, Kaylee Bartell, who is working on site over the next eight weeks. Um, so joining us over a series of open studios, uh, virtually of course, um, this coming Saturday will uh, mark our first open studio with her. And uh, stay tuned for an event that explores Kaylee's work made on site during her time later in October. We are excited to announce that we will be reopening the James Castle House with a new exhibition titled Bricolage. You can join us by scheduling your tours uh, over our new reservation system on our website. You can also learn more about upcoming events and safety protocols online at jamescastlehouse.org. Kaylee Bartell is a contemporary artist based in Baltimore, Maryland. Through painting, drawing, and printmaking, Bartell explores our relationship to homes and interior domestic spaces, investigating how places we associate with safety and familiarity can make us feel unsettled or uncanny. Kaylee's completed her undergraduate education at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she received a bachelor's degree in both fine arts and Latin. She received her MFA from Leroy E. Hoffenberger School of Painting at Maryland Institute College of Art. Kaylee is the recipient of the 2016 Hoffberger Foundation Fellowship and a 2019 Vermont Studio Center residency. Tonight, we will be taking questions for Kaylee and her work. Please send your questions through the chat. Um, we will be answering these questions at the end of the talk. But without further ado, please join me in welcoming Kaylee Bartell to the James Castle House. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Lavona, for interpreting today. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. Um, we're going to switch to share mode so we can see the slides. All right. So um, I'm going to be showing um, different bodies of work from the last few years, um, just to give you an idea 
The, the work I'm showing is somewhat chronological. I'm going to show some early painting and some prints um, followed by another group of paintings and sort of back and forth between different paintings and print making techniques that I've been exploring the last few years. Um, I wanted to start with uh, this piece. Um, this will be the earliest one I show tonight. Um, in putting this slide talk together, um, it was kind of interesting going back to um, previous work and uh, seeing ways it kind of connects to the work I'm doing now. Um, so this piece is oil paint and toner on multiple panels. Um, sort of a single room seen in the panoramic view, um, but things about the architecture between one panel to the next don't exactly match up. Um, some things are slightly off kilter or um, off of the perspective you might expect. Um, so it was kind of interesting to see how um, these long panoramic stretches have come back again in newer work, as well as sort of the fragmented quality of multiple views of the same room. Um, as Rachel mentioned in my introduction, most of my work is focused on interior spaces, especially, or more particularly, domestic spaces of homes. And I've been working with these images and ideas um, for the last few years and thinking of how a space like a home in which you might expect or desire safety or comfort and how that can be disrupted or um, a comfortable space becomes unsettling or uncanny. And that can involve um, disrupting the architecture itself in some way. Um, like in this example, uh, you feel like a, a room that kind of makes sense, but then you have this wall uh, sort of cutting off your view of the room, uh, both blocking and revealing different views of a space that should make sense. Um, it can also involve letting the material of the paint itself suggest um, this notion of something damaged or decayed. Um, so this, uh, this piece is pretty small. It's about 12 inches square. Um, and oil and acrylic paint on panel, um, as well as toner. Um, so I was very interested in the this quality of the paint dissolving uh, the view of the room and seeing things be in the state of flux where you're not sure if they are coming into your view or disappearing and uh, fading away. This is another piece um, that is acrylic and oil on panel. And I think it uh, sort of highlights both of those things where the architecture itself is disrupted, um, but the actual fluid material quality of the paint also suggests this sort of groundlessness or stability. Um, and I became very interested in the way uh, the viewer could somewhat enter this space, this void, space within the room, um, but also the way that it's made altered, um, where this room that should make sense kind of feels like it's twisted or torqued in a, an odd way due to the architectural changes of, between the, these walls and floor shapes. So all of these early paintings I'm showing are pretty small, about 12 inches square and on panel. And I found that surface very uh, interesting for me, just like in allowing the paint to sort of flow and pool and puddle on the surface rather than be uh, like absorbed entirely. This piece is a little bit bigger, um, about 16 by 20 inches, um, acrylic and toner as well. 
Um, a lot of my imagery comes from memories of places that I've lived. So I reflect on experiences I've had in those homes, um, but also invented spaces. Um, a lot of imagery I'm drawn to is from things like film sets or theater sets. Um, also uh, online real estate listings. So I have collections of images that I've found interesting online. Um, and I don't exactly look at these images while I'm creating a painting, but they are just something that I'm always consuming in other times. Uh, when I'm not in the studio, I'm always like, looking at these things. And so they kind of inform um, the way I think about spaces. And um, it, in terms of the cinematic or theatrical sets that I'm interested in, um, that became very interesting for me to just spaces that the viewer could go in, since it may be obvious now, um, there aren't any depicted people in the rooms. Um, so I was interested in how the viewer could kind of take that position instead and the way these objects or furniture pieces sort of feel like um, set or props that, that suggest the presence of the inhabitant who's absent. There's also this sense um, that something could be about to happen or has just happened that when you uh, come across this room, um, but it's sort of unclear what that might be. And so I was very drawn to that sort of unsettled nature. And around that time, I was getting a, a little bit frustrated with my painting and kind of struggling with the way uh, I was painting, feeling very fussy about uh, the way things were rendered. Um, it felt like I was bringing attention to certain pieces of the painting that was not really in service to anything. So I would be fussing over uh, rendering a particular shape of a chair. Um, but it would just end up feeling overworked and drawing attention in a way that was not productive. Um, or I would be focused on one element of the painting and not be able to step back and see how it was functioning with the, the whole atmosphere of the piece. So just to sort of break habits, I started to get back into monotypes, which is a, a form of printmaking that I had been doing for a number of years, but kind of took a break from so it was very beneficial for me to get back into this printmaking technique. Um, it's still a very painterly process, um, but what it allowed me to do was to loosen up my gestures again. And I drastically reduced color palettes. Um, and it felt like the number of moves it took for me to describe a form was um, decrease and it, it just felt more spontaneous. I also really liked um, the transparency of the ink. There was always some uh, transparency and layering of that in the previous work, um, but it, it just really came to the fore in these bodies of monotypes. So these are all uh, about nine inches square um, monotypes on paper that I was doing um, in my studio just uh, printing by hand, um, so no press, very immediate, uh, spontaneous. And so with the benefit of the transparent ink, um, I started to get into creating light through wiping that ink away rather than um, mixing lighter hues of a color and rendering light in that way. So there's still this interest in light, transparent layers. Um, the transparency, I think, also sort of gets at that notion of things in flux, where um, things could be dissolving in the background or just coming into view barely.
And so getting back to printmaking was kind of a breakthrough for other paintings that I was working on as I became more comfortable wiping things away to create light as I do in a monotype using printmaking ink uh, itself in the painting, which this is one example of. This is about probably 18 by 20 inches or so, uh, oil paint and printing ink on canvas. Um, this is a, a much bigger painting, um, about four by five feet. Um, there are things I like about this piece and things I really don't, but uh, one of the things I want to draw attention to is the sort of emptiness in the center where all these perspective lines from the ceiling and this table sort of point to the middle of the canvas um, where you might expect this strong focal point or something with a lot of presence, but it's really just uh, an absence um, and things wiped away. Um, so I became very interested in things like this um, and getting the rhythm of these forms across the canvas through this, this wallpaper pattern, for example. In person, there's uh, a lot of variation in the surface between opaque thick layers of paint and things that look like they're wiped away or sort of in decay. Um, so these are some things that were becoming more and more important to me um, after going through that whole process of printmaking or coming back to printmaking. This is another pretty large painting. It's about four feet square, um, oil on canvas, which is over canvas over panel. Um, in this example, I kind of wanted to see what would happen when the space was completely emptied of objects, or recognizable objects. Um, and the movement around the forms of the square in and out of different depths and perspectives became very interesting to me. Um, so it's kind of just bands of thin, thin applications of paint, um, sort of a geometric abstraction in a way. Um, but then little details like this strike plate, which is in the bottom right of the corner of the painting, kind of gives you the clue into understanding how these planes of color work together. And again, um, just like in the previous painting where the center is sort of uh, wiped away and evoking an absence, a lot of these, uh, these wall shapes are really just wiped away peak layers of paint as well. Or this detail in the back of this uh, molding, it's the only sort of, one of the only recognizable um, depictions of something in the real world, but it's something that is scraped away and uh, a literal absence of paint on the surface. Um, this is another uh, painting about four feet square, uh, acrylic, oil, and graphite on canvas. Um, so again, we have a lot of thin layers of paint, thin washes. Um, I tend to kind of flood the surface with paint, um, but they are organized in an architectural way. Um, and again, I was very interested in orchestrating this rhythm of the banisters across the canvas and figuring out how that would create movement upwards or downwards on the staircase shape. This piece is about um, 52 by 60 inches, I would say, um, acrylic, oil, graphite, and toner on canvas. Um, and I think I mentioned earlier that um, I have an interest in online real estate uh, listings and images of homes um, and also like virtual tours of those spaces and the way you can kind of click through rooms. Um, and so I feel like that's sort of 
uh, evident in the painting. I feel like there's sort of a telescoping effect where this dark purple blue space in the back, it has such depth, but, um, and the perspectival lines of this gray space sort of emphasize that and point towards that far back wall. But the way the, the light is in that purple room, it brings it right up to the picture plane again. So you have this sort of back and forth um, that happens between the perspective shift and the light bringing it closer to your eye. And that I think is emphasized again with this bright yellow frame. Um, Cause really the painting is very monotone and gray except for this purple and yellow uh, relationship. So tying those two together was um, kind of a fun game. Uh, that I got to do as uh, a painter here. I'm gonna switch to a slightly different body of work. Um, coming off of my interest in printmaking, I, I wanted to see different ways of bringing printmaking techniques into some of my painted work. Um, so that resulted in some of these diptychs. Um, so in this example, I was using sheets of mylar that I would paint on and then apply that paint from the mylar onto the canvas and see what kind of traces could be achieved uh, from that technique. And um, in this example, I was printing, uh, printing a view of the same room off of one side to the other. So kind of using one side of the diptych as the printing matrix for the other side. And I was very interested in, in um, how the viewer has to sort of track between two sides of the same piece and figure out, um, or there's a uncertainty about what is the real space and what is an imagined space or what time of day this space is in, or is it a dream or is it a memory? This was a, a larger example. The, I kind of think of these two as separate paintings, um, each one individual, but I did print off of them um, to get different effects. And they're pretty large. Um, I think the one on the left is 60 by 66 inches. And the one on the right is 50 by 60 inches. Um, so again, just interested in this mirroring effect of um, using one side as a printing matrix for the other side. And then working back into that, um, that printed element through painting as well. Uh, okay, back to some other printmaking questions I have. Um, I've been researching this technique of lithography called mokulito, which is basically wood lithography. And for those of you who aren't familiar, um, lithography is a printmaking technique that's traditionally done on limestone. Um, but this method is done with sheets of plywood. Um, so I was very interested in this for the accessibility it has. You don't need to have a specialized litho press to do this, you can do it on more affordable wood uh, matrix rather than the expensive limestone that is hard to find. Um, but you still use the same oily drawing materials as you would as the traditional lithographic stone. Um, but you're able to achieve um, this very interesting atmosphere as the wood grain comes, comes out in, into the print and you get shorter additions because um, the drawing is not as stable on the wood. So as you print more and more uh, impressions from your plate, the drawing starts to sort of degrade and you get different effects. So this was my first experiment in Mokulito, um, just sort of seeing what could happen. And you can kind of see the way the drawing on the right, um, this sort of green colored one is a uh, much later impression and things start to fade away and other elements of the wood start to come to the front. Um, this was one of the last impressions I did of that drawing and another 
uh, element of this process is you can carve into the wood, just like um, a wood relief. So this just had a little bit of wood cut in there as well. And I'm hoping to do some more experiments with this technique while I'm in residence here at the James Castle House. Um, so I'm really looking forward to exploring that research more and seeing what I can achieve with that. This is another example that's about 10 by 20 inches. In this example, I feel the wood grain is coming um, a little bit more into play as well as it disrupts the drawn elements. This one is small, about five by seven inches. Um, this next grouping of work um, is work that I did last year in my residency in Vermont. Um, it's, it felt very different, uh, a completely different body of work for me. Um, still an interest in light and interior spaces, but um, a different sort of softness and a uh, completely different uh, vantage point, I think. Um, but they're definitely still sort of groundless and um, kind of a, an interest in looking up at the ceilings and taking, putting attention on things that might not normally get attention. Um, I, I was kind of sick of dealing with gravity in a way with um, the other interiors I had. So I just decided to take the floor out entirely um, and just sort of look up at ceilings and lights. So these are all pretty small, about five by seven inches uh, acrylic and graphite on panel. And I kind of, Abandoned some of this work for a little while, but I've been getting back into some of these uh, in the last few weeks here at the James Castle House. This is um, a small piece on paper that I did just this last couple of weeks. Um, again, acrylic and graphite. And this last grouping of work um, is probably the newest and the work that I have most curiosity or uncertainty about. Um, I'm still kind of thinking through these ideas, um, so it's very new. Uh, but I've been thinking about um, fragmentation and cropping and rejoining things. So these are some collages I made, um, I think I started making these this, just this spring. Um, they are images drawn from interior design magazines that I've cut up and reconjoined in different ways. Um, I started getting interested in these collages um, and ideas about fragmentation because of cut up poetry. Um, if you are, are familiar with this technique, um, I think it was started in the 20s, like with the Dada movement, but maybe made most famous in the 50s and 60s with um, people like William F. Burroughs and Brian Geisen, um, where you can take a completed text, cut it up, and rearrange that text to create new language or new poems. Um, so I was very interested in that. I've, in previous years, I've done cut up poetry myself with writings of people who are important to me and just seeing what new ideas come about through uh, cutting things up and rearranging them. So I started to think about how I could do that with images. Um, so I was using these collages as a way to get into that. Um, so these are pretty small. I think most of them are nine by six inches on paper or nine by 12 inches, that's the largest. And that led me to want to paint some more of them as well and think about how 
the different shapes of the different uh, the rings that I select, how they eventually come together in one image. I'm still kind of figuring that out and navigating how different edges meet. And these paintings are also still very small, about eight by 10 inches. And I guess um, what interests me about this is the way the fragment sort of suggests this notion of a loss of wholeness or um, a disruption of a connection where you see uh, an image of a room that looks familiar or easy to understand and navigate, but because of the cut and the, the fracture, it sort of disrupts everything and you're not really sure where you stand in it. These are some of those paintings, collage-like paintings that I made uh, while in the studio here. So these are very new. This is oil on panel. And yeah, I think this is my last slide. So I can take questions now if we have any, or go back to any images if we need to look at those again. Thank you, Kaylee. That was uh, incredible to see your work and to hear um, your thoughts behind the work. Um, we do have a question, uh, particular about your use of oil and acrylic in the same body of work. Can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about how you use those two, two materials simultaneously? Yeah, so usually if a piece has uh, acrylic oil and something else like graphite or toner, I, it's usually because I do an acrylic underpainting in very thin layers just to sort of block out certain drawn elements and figure out where things will go and let that dry before I get into the rest of the, the, the painting. I'm very seldom working with them simultaneously. It's usually an acrylic underpainting on top of which I'll add other elements. Great. Can you talk a little bit more about how being at the James Castle House or maybe particularly having just quarantined for two weeks or maybe a combination of the two has inspired your work so far? Yeah. Um, well, one of the amazing things about being here is um, the access to seeing some of his work that I haven't seen before. Um, I have seen a number of his pieces in galleries and museums, um, but they were all sort of of one type of work and now that I'm here I'm seeing uh, a little bit more of the breadth of ideas he covered like with his constructions and text-based work that I really had never seen before um, so that's been very exciting uh, and I'm I think I'm still going to need some time to absorb all of it because there's just so much um, but one thing I I do think is present between us both is sort of an attention to what you see every day and also attention to things that are uh, maybe considered mundane or things that are often overlooked. Um, so that I think has been very important in thinking about his work in relation to mine. I have another question. Does the practice of creating fragmented collages change how you experience being in, in a space or in the space at the James Castle House? Yeah, I think in general, it's kind of changed the way I see, in, like period, the way I have vision, because I notice um, the way that I would select elements of the printed image of the magazine, um, I start to, kind of make those selections when I'm looking at something as well. So I'll look at a door or a window here in the house and kind of 
mentally make cuts around it. Um, and I've noticed that in Baltimore as well, um, in places that I, I go to every day. I'm just, as, as somebody who's uh, watched you quarantine now for two weeks, um, having come to Boise, and I think this is your first time here, is that right? In yeah. Boise? I'm just curious um, what that process was like for you, coming to an unfamiliar place and being in an unfamiliar place, and um, has quarantining, not just now, but in the past few months, inspired you, helped you, I mean, you've kind of gone inward into your home space. Has that brought a different perspective to your work? Um, has that felt more challenging to your work? I'm just curious how, uh, because your work deals so much with interior space, if being forced to be inside and kind of maybe look at things differently or have more time to look at things, if that's informed your work or um, helped your work move in a different direction or expanded your work. Well, I, I'm not sure if it has changed anything for me since I've been working with these interiors for so long. I kind of feel like, in a way, quarantining or being in one location has been part of my life this whole time. Where, like, noticing these little things has been a part of my work the whole time. But I will say it in the last few months as other people have been experiencing this and maybe for the first time having to spend long periods of time just at home and not really um, experiencing the outside world, it feels like talking about the work is a little bit easier. I feel like in the past, not everybody would get that, or my, my belief that being in a home can be very like anxious and uncanny. I feel like now that people are experiencing these sort of domestic spaces themselves or noticing things about their own home environments more um, just because they're forced to spend more time there, it does feel like um, the conversations have been a little bit different. Um, I have a question, or I guess a comment and a question from our participant. Uh, Kaylee, your work is incredible. I love you. that you scan real estate listings from interior scenes. What are the qualities of those interiors that catch your eye that you typically use in your work? Oh, um, there's a lot of different things. I think um, there's something about the strange angles that the person taking the picture um, will will take and it's sort of this forced perspective um, that is very interesting to me, especially um, thinking about a person who's trying to make their home look very beautiful or like a, a large open space will take a, a, a photo from a certain angle, but we know that it's probably much smaller and like more compact. Um, there's also elements of light that is interesting um, and the way some listings will have like an abundance of the previous owner's possessions and um, those things can be very interesting but then how certain staged homes can look very sterile or, or soulless or things like that it, but there's really no difference it's still like furniture and some objects that you can just sort of get this sense of one of these is a home where a family still lives there and one definitely isn't. I kind of just collect things like that and just kind of have them on my computer or on my phone for a long time and look at them. Do you work with magazines or, uh, or a combination of digital photographs and magazines? Um, the only magazines I had were these ones that I made these collages from. Um, I think those were mostly like architectural digests and things like this. Um, but the, the digital ones can kind of range from very sort of interior designy, very elegant and uh, fancy rooms to very like more uh, quiet and rural spaces, things like that. I have a question here. Um, you mentioned that several of your pieces use toner. 
I'm only yeah. familiar with toner as part of printers. Is there something you can purchase outside of a toner cartridge? It actually is just the same material as is in a toner cartridge. You can buy like bottles of it. Um, and I first started using this in my lithography where you can use it as a drawing material on the stone itself or create transparencies to expose on a lithographic plate. Um, and it creates, when used as a drawing material or like paint, it kind of creates this beautiful reticulation pattern. It's sort of like, um, I don't know, like seeing silt at like a river basin or something. It's kind of an indescribable flow of material on the surface. Um, so I started using toner in litho as a printmaking material. And then later on, I just started painting with it, like kind of using it as pigment almost. Um, you, there are some concerns with it because um, it's basically like little plastic dust. So you have to find a way to fix it to the surface. Um, so I usually mix it with um, like an oil or a medium, like a matte medium or something like that if I'm using it as paint. Interesting. Um, you mentioned that you're interested in stage sets. I wonder if you're also interested in set design and film and cinema in terms of like cinematic tropes, like horror genres come to mind. Does that play a role in your work? Yes, it definitely did. Um, I am really drawn to things like old German expressionist film or um, like sort of, uh, I guess David Lynch could be an example where these sort of horrible, scary, or uh, uncanny things that are kind of happening in a small town setting or like a little, a little house or domestic setting. Um, and in through cinema and like collecting film stills that I am drawn to, I kind of notice the way the film director, the viewer, is sort of interesting about where I, as a painter, am putting the viewer as well. Um, so that's one of the ways I kind of think about film or get interested in film as well. So when in your artistic journey did interior spaces become central to your work? Um, probably when I was still an undergrad, which would be about nine years ago, seven or nine years ago. Um, so I've been working with this imagery since probably 2011. Yeah. Um, and I guess it's just been very fruitful ground that I haven't wanted to depart from, or I'm, I'm still finding new things within this idea of a house or a home that is interesting to me. Um, do you ever deal with copyright issues when using architectural images cut out of magazines um, is one question. And the second question, kind of unrelated, uh, actually I'll ask that after this. So first question, do you deal with copyright issues when using architectural images cut out of magazines? Well, I haven't gotten any like cease and desist letters or something there yet. Um, they're still very new. So I don't know if I'll run into that issue in the future, but they, it does kind of feel like um, they're so like divorced from the, the original context that it hasn't been a concern or something that I've thought about too much yet because I, I cut so much information out. Yeah, typically there's like a percentage that you have to remove for it to be copyright yeah, free. That's true. Um, the other question is more about the toner. Do you apply the toner with water and a brush? Um, yeah, basically water and a brush um, and usually add, I think you can add like dish soap or there's this thing called photo flow that um, can also achieve that, uh, that pattern that happens with the toner but then you do have to make sure not to move it too much before you fix it onto the surface. I love this uh, combination of technical questions and uh, <laughs> questions related yeah. to your inspiration. 
Um, so another one uh, relating to your inspiration, um, do you ever experience outside spaces that may kind of also fall into the mix of um, content that uh, appears in your work? Um, that is a good question. There, And I didn't show any of this work, but there was um, a period very early on where I was kind of combining interior spaces with landscapes and um, kind of getting to something uncanny or dreamlike or memory-like by seeing how those those spaces could combine and overlap. Um, but yeah, it hasn't really come up again since then. But um, part of being in this new landscape here in Boise, uh, I've kind of been itching to to do that more or just see what I what I can learn just being in this new landscape and having a completely different world out my window than I do in Baltimore, so. Uh, another question about scale. So when do you determine the scale of your canvas? So when is it a small piece? When is it a big piece? Um, that is something I'm not really sure about. Sometimes it's just about what I have at hand. Um, like if I have a bunch of paper that's about this size, I'll have an entire series of that of that work, and it's sort of just um, a random occurrence. So I think it's mostly just what I what I find. Um, yeah, it's it's a bit random. Another question, particular to your inspiration of interiors: Do you ever work from your own spaces or spaces that may, um, you know, relate to memory? Uh, family space, friend space, does any of that appear in your work? I think it does, um, especially early on. It was a lot of memories of houses that I lived in and reflecting on experiences in them. Um, I think as I've continued with this work, there's been a desire for some of it to feel less autobiographical and not to take myself out of it completely, but just to have it a little bit more open and not so connected to my own memories. Um, but I'm always like taking pictures of things around me and um, houses I live in and just noticing things like that. So even if um, I'm not drawing from observation exactly, it's still like a, an ongoing archiving of things that I, I see and live with. Well, that makes sense. Um, what other artists excite and inspire you or musicians or filmmakers or anybody working in the creative field? Who's inspiring you? Um, God, there's so much. Um, I've been very interested in another painter, um, Brandy Twiley, who I think just had a show of paintings she did that were when she was living in her studio. Um, those have been really interesting to me. And um, I love Milton Avery. Um, I never get tired of looking at his paintings. Um, I think he's a great colorist. And the way he divides the rectangle of the painting up is just always perfect to me. And, I've never seen a bad one, in my opinion. Um, oh, man. I, it's so funny when people ask me that, because I know of so many artists and things that I love, but to, like, draw them all up right now, it's very difficult. <laughs> um, I guess um, the other thing I would um, put out there is something that I don't have a lot of knowledge of, but um, in Vermont, there was an artist who recommended that I check out this branch of philosophy called object-oriented ontology. Um, so I've been kind of trying to read more about that and just see how it resonates with my work. Um, it's kind of looking at um, philosophy without privileging a human vantage point. Um, so thinking about the life of objects around us and things. So some of it's a little bit um, advanced and I'm no expert on philosophy but it's been kind of interesting to think about um 
that sounds very central to some of the things that we explore at the Castle House. Mm -hmm. Is there um, any titles that you could recommend for anybody who may be interested in that? Yeah. Um, Timothy Morton is one of the names like in this field of philosophy, and he has a book called Hyper Objects, um, which I still need to read, but I've been kind of listening to some of his lectures on YouTube. Um, he has one called Haunted Haunted Houses that I thought was pretty compelling and probably relevant to my interests. Um, and then I think the other writer is Daniel Graham or something like this. I might have to look up the name. Um, but basically, uh, if you like Google object-oriented ontology, his name will, will come right up and it's sort of a new a new branch of philosophy, I think, but it's been pretty interesting ground. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, so I have a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. This is an easy one, so we'll end on an easy one. Um, so the James Castle House residency wing is a little unusual in that the kitchen and the studio and sort of like the common space is all one. Um, and in the kitchen, you have a variety of interesting things to prepare meals on, like a hot plate mm -hmm. and a microwave and a crock pot. Um, and I'm always really curious how our artists are preparing meals. Like, are you, um, we've had people uh, create really gourmet, fancy, very ornate uh, spreads. And then we've had people who particularly just live off of uh, pizza. So I'm curious uh, if you've had any cooking adventures in the studio so far. Oh, cooking adventures. Um, not exactly. I, I, I kind of joke about this. I work um, in a kitchen back in Baltimore, but I get made fun of because I don't really like food at all. I find it very inconvenient to have to prepare meals every day. Um, so a lot of the food I'm making here has been like chopped vegetables, with like rice or like a salad with um, cucumber, tomato, peppers, and like lemon juice, like just simple things like that. So anything that's quick, chopped vegetables is like the best thing in the world to me. Um, that's usually where my meals are at, especially awesome. here, yeah. <laughs> Keep it simple. Yeah. Um, well, I just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. And I do want to apologize. We had some technical difficulties in the beginning with uh, getting our screens oriented with interpretation. Um, so we will be posting this uh, video, this recording of the video um, with a transcript. So for those of you who missed out the beginning of the ASL interpretation, we will be um, offering that. Um, I also would like to invite you all to join us for another adventure in virtual programming um, for us at the James Castle House, which is um, an open studio. Uh, we'll be doing open studios with Kaylee for the next few weeks. Um, and the first open studio is this Saturday at 2 p.m. Um, and it will be a Zoom meeting. So everybody will be able to see everybody's face and participate in a more conversational type of experience. So um, definitely consider joining us. It is at 2 p.m. this Saturday and you can find the link to that on the James Castle House website. You can also uh, explore more of Kaylee's work on our website. Um, so definitely join us online at thejamescastlehouse.org. And I just want to thank you, Kaylee, for being vulnerable with us and sharing your work and exploring some of your inspiration. And um, yeah, so thank you so much. And I also would like to thank Lavona, um, our interpreter, who um, has been working with us at the James Castle House for a couple of years now. So we're really privileged to have her um, on our on our team. So thank you so thank much. Thank you, Lavona. And thank you all. Yeah, well, good night, and I hope to see you guys at our open studio. See you Saturday. All right, take care.